Hi there, this is Ron Rogers, and this is Out at Edwards. But wait, the plot thickens. Edwards Part 2. Now, this is a time when decisions that I made and decisions that were made for me came and severely impacted my plans. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> you don't always know about decisions you make, and that's kind of the thing of it. And little decisions can just cascade. Like I mentioned earlier, if I'd gone to Williams instead of Vance and not had such a turkey as an instructor, I could have gone a whole different way. Um, and, you know, just all sorts of things come together. And, and here's what's going on with the deal out at Edwards then. You know, I came out there to do flight tests. That's what I wanted to do because at the time, like I mentioned at Vance, um, you were lucky if you were getting a commissary job or, a, you know, a missile silo and the instructors were getting no flying jobs. Well, one guy got a KC-135 and personnel was just happy as could be. That's wonderful. No, I don't want to be sacumcised. I didn't because once you're sacumcised, that's an irreversible operation. You know, once they do that to your body, you're never getting out of there. And that wasn't a bit of excitement for me uh, whatsoever. So, you know, I tried to maintain control over my career. And one thing I quickly learned in the Air Force is you have absolutely no control over your career. It's a, it's a, it's a total myth if you think you do. Uh, and, you know, uh, it, when you're in the military, uh, needs of the service are what dictate what happens. And, boy, that's what dictated what happened. So like I said, great things were going on. I mean, there was all sorts of wonder, wonderful stuff going on, chase missions going on. And I was uh, attending the uh, Cal State Fresno. Now, uh, they were teaching it. The instructors on the base were a lot of the uh, test pilot school instructors. And we have one course taught by the Commodore Test Pilot School. So it was really cool. But back when I was a, a tweet instructor, um, I, I was trying to arrange for a correspondence course. And uh, the only thing they had, uh, you know, going on at the time were these MBAs. And I was not interested in an MBA, uh, although now that it, it would have been kind of useful for me and some of the stuff I did later. But at the time, uh, I was concentrating on engineering. So um, I actually contacted Phil Ostriker out at uh, Edwards, and he sent me all sorts of stuff. All sorts of material on the design of the F-16 flight control. And I was uh, putting together a master's program where I was going to uh, develop a battle damage flight control system. Because the F-16 flight control, it will go out of control. The aircraft is unstable in all axes. It will go out of control in less than a second if you do not have the augmented flight control, the fly-by-wire flight control. So uh, if you were having a severe damage to the aircraft, uh, my idea was I would put together a just very simplified flight control system that would be enough to get you back. Now, of course, um, I, I ended up getting a job out at Edwards, which is cool. I, I, I finagled that thing. It took a lot of work, uh, like I mentioned, and, uh, you know, a lot of uh, trying to make it work and uh, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, the guy in MPC who, you know, because he didn't get his job that he wanted, I wasn't going to get the job that I wanted. And yeah, 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 I'm not going to digress in that story. I've talked about that earlier, but I ended up being a chase pilot. Now, you may have seen, I mean, this is an old uh, 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 picture. In fact, this prototype, I believe, is being restored. It was it, it got in terrible shape. It was just setting down there in Fort Worth and decaying, but I believe they're restoring and not flying or anything like that, although they painted some of the new ones like this, um, you know, because it's a historic paint job. Uh, but um, this is this is the job of the chase aircraft to set over the side. Of course, they edit the chase aircraft out when they do the lithographs that uh, everybody gets. But like I said, there was a lot going on. Uh, uh, NASA was doing blivet testing on the space shuttle reentry parachutes. Uh, the B-1 is was in full swing. I got to chase a lot of neat things. SRAM launches out of the center bomb bay, flare launches, uh, high-speed chase. Uh, the A-10 and stuff was under development, and uh, a lot of weapon system separation, gunfire, which was really, really interesting to be next to this thing when it was firing the gun, because um, I was in a chase position, because I've had some people uh, say that, you know, they, they've flown the uh, the A-10 in two-ship formation and been next to them when they've been gunfiring, and, and they didn't feel a thing. Well, the 38 doesn't have as strong as a canopy as the A-10 does, and I'm up there close with the photographer. I mean, we're, we're in very close. We were in flight test chase position, and then that thing would fire. It would shake my canopy. It was quite impressive. And, uh, of course, I talk about in some other videos the challenges of, of 
chasing a high drag aircraft um, with a low drag T-38. And also the shuttle approach and landing tests were going on at the time, and that was really interesting. And as part of the whole job, I got to fly a bunch of interesting aircraft. Uh, the second to the last time I saw this aircraft, um, it was on the flight line, and I had flown it. It was a, It's a YF-4, uh, one of the developmental F-4s, and I happened to see it later. Uh, I was down visiting my sister. She's passed away now, but I was down visiting my sister in Tucson, and we went down to the Pima Air Museum, and I'm walking in there, and I see this aircraft in the museum and you know if that doesn't want to if that doesn't suddenly make you feel old I don't know what does it was kind of a scary proposition but this is it on the flight line back at Edwards when it was nice and new and of course anytime you set an aircraft outside in a museum they, they tend to deteriorate and this is the f-15 I got to fly the f-15 uh, on some test missions out at Edwards which is cool and although I later went in the reserves and flew the A-37 operationally uh, back then, it was used uh, as a chase aircraft, and I got a chance to fly it, so it was quite interesting. Of course, the main fun thing was flying the F-104 with the NASA guys, and I flew with John Mankey, who was head of NASA, and then Bill Dana. And we did these shuttle approaches, 30,000 feet, I talk about this, coming around, uh, you're, you're coming down uh, at uh, a decent rate of 12,000 feet per minute, idle, gear boards, everything hanging out, and uh, 300 knots, and you, you uh, start at 2.5G flare, and it takes 2.5 seconds, and you go from 300 to 180 knots, and you touch down. It was, uh, it was something. And Bill Dana showed me uh, the first one. I, I flew, got to fly uh, several times with the NASA guys. And he showed me the first one. I came around, and uh, uh, I'm coming around on fire. Final, and I said, Bill, when when did you say to flare? And he, he says, at uh, 2,500 feet AGL or when you get scared, whichever comes first. And they, they both kind of came together. Now, it was kind of interesting. You know, I grew up with the nuns, and they're always telling me you're going to go to hell, and you're never going to amount to anything. And, you know, you'll be lucky if you get a job as a gas station attendant. This was back when there was a job as a gas station attendant. You actually, okay, you, you young people, you probably have no idea about this, but you actually drove your car into the gas station. A guy would come out, and he would fill your car with gas. He would wash your windshield, and he would ask you if uh, you wanted him to check the oil level. Yeah, well, they're, they're trying to sell you a quart of oil, you know, so that's how it worked. Of course, the cars back then, they burn a lot more oil than the cars do today. But anyway... Um, the nuns were telling me I was fairly worthless, and I'm sitting down there with Bill, and we're talking, and uh, uh, he's telling me that, uh, you know, uh, uh, come on around more often, you know, uh, uh, you know, we, we, uh, you did a good job flying, and we like you, and, and we'd, we'd like to, we'd like to see you more over here. Well, I thought he was just being gracious, you know, I thought he didn't really mean it. Um, I later found out um, I easily could have been selected uh, to work there at Dryden, now called Armstrong, uh, because they tended to do that. They, they found pilots they liked, and they brought them in. But, uh, you know, none, none's telling me. I, I think this is always in the back of my mind. And um, I've also heard that uh, pilots have this uh, little thing where they feel that they've got to prove something, uh, mostly because a lot of people... You know, they may have been told sometime in their life that they're, you know, they're not too terribly wonderful and they'll never amount to anything like me. And, and maybe they have this feeling they have to prove themselves. And, uh, you know, I just had the feeling that they were being nice and uh, they weren't really inviting me. And I later found out that, no, they, they would have brought me on. And, and you talk about something uh, that would have changed my whole career. I could have been a pilot out at uh, Dryden there for many years, as, as a number of people did do. Although... When I came out there for a mission, we, um, uh, it was funny, one of the uh, uh, F-18 pilots, um, well, I flew with uh, Gordon Furleton, but my son got an F-18 flight also, and civilian pilot, they put him in the front seat. Yeah, can you believe that? Uh, kind of a cool deal. And, uh, uh, but that, uh, he, they had some uh, maintenance problems, I'm digressing here, they had some maintenance problems with the F-18, so my son spent a good number of days out there. He got to know the guys, and we actually um, uh, caused one of the um, uh, NASA test pilots to actually get hired by United Airlines, but then, of course, he promptly got furloughed because 9-11 uh, and all this stuff, and uh, I think it might have actually been before that. It was an economy turn, turned down, but anyway, he got furloughed, and uh, he later uh, went on and uh, actually had a very interesting uh, career, um, uh, but I digress on that. 
All right. Uh, one other interesting thing that happened out there is they used this B-26 at the test pilot school, uh, and they could make it, you, you, the uh, student sat in the right seat, and uh, you could have a yoke, you could have a stick, center stick, side stick, and uh, which, of course, the B-26 didn't have. Uh, and you could make the thing fly like anything. You could have an adverse yaw, proverse yaw, you could make it extremely stable you could make it unstable you could i mean they could go through this whole thing and they could make the aircraft so unstable that it was virtually unflyable and all this jockeying around where the aircraft would move and stuff uh it was electronic flight control system the little guy over there he'd he'd uh, tweak some pots and then he'd say okay fly this what do you think and i'm sitting there flying it you know and and he says uh, i've got a, a stick here uh, you know and he says well what what did i do there and i go I'm not really sure. And I go, I mean, it flies well, you know, it's, it, it's a reasonably responsive aircraft. And he says, I, I froze the stick. That is now a force controller, not, uh, it's not geared to movement. Instead of a displacement causing a control surf deflection, you just added pressure. And it was interesting because I didn't realize that that was the change he made. But Okay, decisions, stuff like that. This aircraft was being retired by CalSpan. They're the corporation that owned it. And just shortly, a week before it was retired, the, the base general was going to fly it, but a week before it was retired, uh, it was out in the area and uh, the wings separated uh, due to fatigue and the three pilots on board were killed. And of course, it's a lot of things in the military. You, you don't want to be on the aircraft that fatally crashes. Sometimes it's your fault. Sometimes it's a mechanical situation where there's no control over it. Anyway, I was having a fun time and I needed uh, to get um, an operational command to get into the, the, the test pilot school. Uh, so I was looking to get a fighter. All right, the guys at personnel, I called them up, you know, and they said, yeah, we're just looking at your file. And I go, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, because I'm, I would like to get a fighter, you know, because I'm doing all this work to get in the test pilot school and stuff like that. And they said, "Yeah, you're 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 uh, you've almost got your double masters in aero and electrical engineering." And I go, "Yeah, yeah." And we see that you've been working on a project on a, a flight control damage situation on the uh, the F-16. And how they knew about that, I have no idea because I didn't really know that that had gotten out anywhere. And I said, "Yeah, we're really interested in your back background there." And uh, uh, we'd like you to be involved with the F-16 uh, flight control section. Actually, uh, you know, you're, uh, you're a captain now. We'd actually like you to head up the uh, flight control uh, section on base there uh, on the military side because you had a lot of civilian people that you interfaced with, and it was amazing. Uh, first lieutenants could have an amazing amount of engineering status that they didn't really deserve, uh, even second lieutenants. Uh, we had one that came to Boeing one time on radar, and they were teaching him, treating him like he was a little god, and I'm going, he's a... He's a second lieutenant, you know, just out of engineering school, doesn't know much of anything. But anyway, uh, I'm thinking, okay, I'm, I'm going to get involved with the F-16 flight control section, be involved in it. I said, that's great. I would love to fly the F-16. And that would that would fit the bill of, you know, uh, operational fight. It wouldn't be operational uh, fighter. It would be involved, uh, I thought. I thought, in uh, flight test activity, because they, they brought a lot of just general pilots in to fly, and I thought this would be a good square filler. And he goes, oh, no, 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 no. It's, it's, it's not a flying job. It's a desk job. And I go, what? Yeah, it's a desk job. Uh, no, no, it's not a flying slot. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to be flying a desk, watching everybody else that, um, you know, uh, fly the airplanes that I used to fly, and I'm going to be sitting at a friggin' desk. I'm going, no, 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 no. I said, aren't you critically short of pilots? Because they were going through a critical pilot shortage at the time. Pilots were getting out right and left. And I said, aren't you critically short of pilots? And they go, oh, yes, yes, we are. But we're even more critically short of electrical engineers with master's degrees. So my decision to enhance my career standing, you know, how good I looked and stuff like this by getting an advanced degree in engineering was actually to my detriment because I was making myself more valuable out of the cockpit than in the cockpit. And I was seeing my career aspirations go down the tube because what would happen is I would have a significant amount of time in the um, military and in the Air Force. And the only operational command I would have would be Air Training Command because systems wasn't considered an operational command. 
and they would send me back to ATC and I would be stuck uh, as an instructor my entire career. And I was not excited about uh, that whatsoever. All my friends that I knew, you know, uh, guys were getting airline jobs and they were just absolutely loving it. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm screwed here. Uh, and, and the funny thing is, uh, Lloyd, the guy who had the Stanovel job before me, uh, he decided he's going to become an airline pilot. And um, uh, so he, you know, uh, uh, interviews and stuff like that. And he, he, uh, he uh, leaves the Air Force. Uh, he doesn't have a job yet with any of the airlines, but he, he gets out. So he's available to be hired. And uh, he, he is interviewing with various uh, uh, airline companies. But uh, we never heard back from him, which is really strange. And uh, the uh, the ones uh, the one uh, sergeant there that was a really fun really funny guy. Uh, and I'm digress here. I he, uh, I, I wanted a bulletin board, and, and and he says, "Well, we can't get that through supply." He says, "But you want a bulletin board? I'll get you a bulletin board." So this bulletin board shows up, and he had big leather couches in his office, you know. But this bulletin board shows up. And uh, I had people coming into my office uh, to debrief check rides. And I noticed one guy looking at it. Um, I think it might have been some midnight pilfering involved getting this bulletin board. I don't know. But anyway, uh, I digress there. But we never heard from Lloyd. And I said to the sergeant, I said, uh, you know, that really surprised me. Uh, he must have gotten a job somewhere. And the sergeant looks at me and laughs. And he says, no. If he would have gotten hired, we had heard about it. And, and uh, I was taxiing out with the, uh, the vice commander who I flew exclusively with. Um, and I said, you know, I, I just didn't understand why Lloyd, you know, apparently didn't get hired that we knew of. And he says, well, I think the problem is Lloyd would make a very good captain. I says, well, that's what they're, they're hiring. He says, no, 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 no. Um, Lloyd was an interesting guy. He come from a very wealthy Southern family. He had a wife who was the perfect Southern belle. I mean, prim, proper. And he, Lloyd had just a lot of cool, you know, I mean, he was a classy guy. And he, and the vice commander said to me, he says, you know, he just won't interview well. He would, uh, he would come across a little too arrogant. And he says, I'm, he, the vice commander told me, he says, I'm not surprised at all that he didn't get hired. And I'm going, wow. Well, of course, this whole thing is developing. And, uh, you know, I told my boss, I said, you know, I'm a career guy. I'm, I'm, I'm not interested in the airlines. And then everything was going downhill, you know, with my career and what I wanted to do and getting stuck in a ground job. I finally went in and I said, you know, sir, I'm thinking of getting out and getting in the airlines. And he just looked at me and he laughed and he says, what is it about that office there? Is that unlucky or something? So I go out to Fox Field and I'm going to get my ATP. I just uh, barely have enough hours, uh, the 1,500 uh, necessary, and I, I think I had to fly a night mission to get my nighttime up because I just didn't have much nighttime. Uh, you didn't fly much nighttime out at Edwards at all. So I'm trying to uh, get up to speed here. Now remember, I'm flying the T-38, and one degree of pitch in the T-38 on approach will give you a 900 foot degree rate of change. You can roll into 28 30 degrees of bank, 28 with standard turn. You can roll into a 30 degree bank turn, and if you don't pull on the stick, your heading doesn't change. Well, okay, I am flying in Apache. 160 horsepower, no accumulators on it, so if you feather the engine, you can't restart it. Um, and uh, this thing, uh, 5 degrees of pitch, doesn't do you anything on approach, you know, as far as VVI. But five degrees of bank and you're gone. I mean, you have turned so far off heading. And to make the job easier, uh, they had this directional gyro, the drum type in there. And you could literally watch it process. You know, you're holding a steady heading and you could just watch the thing process. And, oh, we're going to get that fixed. Yeah, well, in the uh, several weeks to a month that I was getting uh, training to get my AP ATP, they never fixed it at all. So I, you just have to keep adjusting it there. Well, so I go down to Van Nuys to get my ATP check ride, and this was the most difficult, hardest check ride I have ever taken in my life in any aircraft. And um, we go into John Wayne Airport, and I'm flying the fixed card. Uh, I, this is going back. You had to adjust the heading every time you changed it for relative bearing. Fixed card ADF with a DG that processed, 
and the uh, the uh, FAA flight examiner says, okay, we're going to fly this single engine, and the engine there's only a hydraulic pump on one engine on the Apache, and the engine they simulated failure was the one that had the hydraulic pump, so I had to fly a fixed cart ADF adjusting the heading and uh, pumping down the gear by hand right between the seats was where the uh, the gear pump was. I'm doing all this fixed card and <laughs> it was the hardest check ride I ever took. All right, I finally get my ATP airline transport pilot certificate. Now I'm ready to uh, interview and be hired. And uh, you know, it's a little blackout thing there back in the day. Uh, they use your social security number as your. Um, uh, you know, license number. And they also did, that was also your uh, uh, military uh, ID number too. And they, uh, they finally got away with that because of all the problems that was causing. And I start interviewing and I go, I have a, a first interview with United. They did a two-part interview. I come in there, seven of us came in within 20 minutes, five of them were going out because they passed the physical and, and they had a real tight weight restriction, how things changed. Now they don't have that. And this guy, uh, you know, I had a weight restriction of 195 as 6'1", and uh, I was just under that, so that was good. But this one guy sitting there, they, they, and they weren't supposed to tell him why they failed, but somehow had gotten out, and he's sitting there, and he goes, two pounds. I can't believe it, two pounds. The guy was two pounds overweight, and he got rejected. Well, TWA had a one-shot interview, and I went in there, and I did not like their facility in Kansas City. It was a hostile interview. Um you know, it was just amazing. It was a good cop, bad cop. And uh, uh, I think I insulted the interview captain because he said, explain a jet engine. And I was taking a master's degree, uh, compressible fluids uh, course at the time. So I said, how much, you know, how, and I thought pilots, you know, were like the pilots at Edwards. They're real technically sharp. Not all airline pilots are. I know that's a surprise. Uh, and so I said, well, how much uh, detail do you want? And he said, you give me as much detail as you can. So I go up there and I draw four graphs and I talk about stagnation, air temperature, and mass flow and all of this. And I, I get into it, you know, and, and he says, okay, I think you understand. Well, I later realized um, that was way deeper than I think this guy had any understanding. And I ended up getting rejected. I was so absolutely ticked off. But then I went back for the second interview with United. That went well. And I got hired. Of course, the funny thing was, uh, you know, the deal was you you, uh, you sent interviews to everybody because back then things were still regulated. This was before deregulation, you know, or it was at the time it was a changeover. And the idea was, doesn't matter who you get hired by, they're all good. Well, <laughs> Braniff Airlines, yeah, they they uh, they weren't interested in me. That was fine. That, that did me a favor. Oh, the TWA one, uh, they rejected me. Uh, back in 79, but I'm, I'm a 27 captain at United and, uh, I, I meet my new, uh, engineer, second officer and we're talking. He says, yeah, I got hired by TWA in 79. And I looked at him. I said, I got rejected by TWA in 79. And I said, you know, if they would have hired me, uh, instead of you. And, and if, if, cause he interviewed with United and they didn't hire him. I said, and if United would have hired you back in 79, you would be in the captain seat and I'd be the, the engineer. And then the funny thing was the very last day I'm getting ready to leave, uh, Edwards. Um, I get the mail and it's an invite from uh, American airlines to come out, uh, to an interview. Well, I was on my way to training. So, um, I, I already had that made. All right, so welcome to training as a brand new airline pilot. Well, things were going good when I started uh, uh, training in August of 79, and they were telling me, man, United's hiring 500 a year for the next five years. You'll be a co-pilot in two years. And uh, yeah, I uh, ugh, I don't ever want to hear that again, because uh, when two years came, I still had two and a half years of furlough to go. But um, anyway, uh I was a uh, bottom guy in my class and uh, it was, you know, not because I was deficient or anything like that. They went by age and I was the youngest guy by three years in my class, which had an interesting effect. I was uh, uh, 29 at the time and um, uh, I was three years younger than the next youngest guy. And when they, when the rule changed that you retired at 65 instead of 60, it was a while before I realized, looking at the seniority list, that uh, everybody in my class 
missed the cutoff. I was the only one who survived in the class because I was uh, uh, three years younger. So, okay. Uh, they said, well, we, we need you to bid aircraft. And I go, you know, I could, I could bid a helicopter to Texas. I'm the bottom guy. I'll get whatever left over. And a 737 to Cleveland, what was left at, left o what was left over. So I went through four weeks of training uh, as a, a 727 engineer because you wanted a real engineer ticket and that kind of showed that you could do this. You know, it was kind of a test and you got the ticket. And then I went through two weeks of uh, 737 engineer, and I'll explain that whole thing in a, in a moment, uh, engineer training. Uh, and uh, yeah, so my whole class had uh, gone away. Uh, they had on the line, they were flying. I was still in training. I, I was, well, there were actually three of us that were still in training and uh, two graduated the um, the one day and I was going to graduate the next day. And that made a big difference. I was junior. So uh, they, they went to the line, they were fine. And uh, I was furloughed out of the training center. I got the call the, the night before. See, like halfway through, uh, the other airlines started started to furlough, and they said, "No, no, 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 no. We're um, United will not furlough. Um, you know, we're strong and all this stuff." And I go, "Yeah, right." Well, I got a call the day before us to graduate, and they said, "I am sorry, uh, you're being furloughed." And, you know, I was in the Air Force, and I thought job security was you changed uh, bases every three to four years. Now it was, hey, sorry, we made a mistake. We really don't need as many pilots. Bye, bye, bye. Go go, go find the door there. There's, there's the street. And it's like, what the heck am I going to do now? So that was quite a challenge that wasn't a wonderful challenge and stuff like that. And, of course... Uh, if I had been hired by American, things would have been uh, different. Uh, the, uh, they had had a big delay in in, drop in in hiring people, so they moved up very rapidly. I was uh, after I got recalled. I'm I'm flying as co-pilot out of uh, Chicago, and the controller says American such and such, and he goes, Oh, I'm sorry, United such and such, and I I was operating the radios, uh, being the uh, co-pilot in the captain's leg. Uh, so I keyed the mic and I said, you're sorry, if this was American, I'd be the captain. So of course, uh, American, except for the, you know, um, the, uh, your, uh, the, uh, um, South American, uh, international, they didn't have really quite as big international presence as United acquired after buying, uh, Pan Am and stuff like that, the Pacific, uh, section of Pan Am. So, um, I think it worked out better in the long run and they're both different personalities uh too between united pilots it's kind of like uh they uh, uh one of the guys said to me you know if united hired you it pretty much meant that american wouldn't because you were a different personality type so anyway um enough of those digressions we'll continue on with the uh the rest of the story hey thanks for watching